Well, let me invite you to turn your copy of God's Word tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12. And in most of the Pew Bibles, our text should be found on page 1114. Two weeks we began our study, which will take uh, chapters 12 through 14 to con- conclude, uh, studying the topic of spiritual gifts. Uh, last time we looked at the fact that spiritual gifts are given by God the Spirit uh, for the purpose of serving one another. And we're going to kind of pick up with that same theme, uh, but our text tonight deals with the metaphor of the body and how that teaches us the purpose of spiritual gifts. Uh, So tonight we want to look at verses 12 through 31 of 1 Corinthians 12. This is God's holy word. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the eye should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body which seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts that we think less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. And uh, as always, let's pray to God the Holy Spirit now to bless the preaching of this text. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we thank you for your church. Father, most of all, we thank you for the groom of the church, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, tonight as we close out your Lord's Day, we pray now that you would send the Spirit, that he would be a blessing to each of us who are hearing this message tonight. Father, we pray that he would open it up, that he would apply it. And Father, that as the body of Christ, Father, we would learn how to live as the body of Christ together, using our gifts in service to one another. And so, Father, help us to that end, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, back when I was in high school, uh, in my literature class, I had to memorize or learn a couple of poems, and then when the exam came, I had to write an essay on some of those poems. And uh, one of those poems that I remember back to is entitled, For Want of a Nail. Uh, Let me read you that brief poem for a minute. The poem goes as follows, For want of a nail, speaking of a horseshoe nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of the message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. 
Now, when I think back to my essay, I have no idea what I wrote all those years ago, but I think I wrote something along the line that the poem is meant to teach us that, that the small things of life are entirely vital. And even as I read it now, I do think that's the correct interpretation. Whoever wrote that poem was driving home that the big things in life, the, the seemingly all-important events and all the things that we do that, that seem the most important, if you break it down, there are small hidden things that play a role, and if one of those small little hidden things is not properly function, functioning, uh, it could threaten the big things. And so it may seem impossible, it may seem in some sense ludicrous, that for the want of a horseshoe nail, the kingdom is lost, but the point is this, small things matter. Those things which are hidden that take place behind the scene matter. And I think that's exactly Paul's point in the text we just read from 1 Corinthians 12. That in the life of the body of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, we saw two weeks ago, each member is given spiritual gifts for the sake of serving the common good. And now Paul begins to press in by pointing out that behind the scenes, the, the unseen use of gifts actually are those which are most vital to the life of the church. And if some members of the church are not exercising those gifts, well, then the body will suffer. There's harm done. The, the ministry of the church is actually hampered when gifts are not used behind the scenes. The temptation, as always, is to prize and to highlight the major gifts, the more visible gifts, Paul says, uh, the lesser known, invisible gifts being used are absolutely vital. And, and that's the context here. We remember from two weeks ago that, that the church in Corinth was dividing. As we've seen throughout our study of this letter, they specialized in division. And once again, they were dividing over various gifts. In a couple of weeks, we'll note that speaking in tongues was the chief gift that everyone wanted to stand front and center, to be the center of attention. And if you didn't have that gift, well, you either thought of yourself or you were told you were insignificant and you were uh, less needed in the life of the church. And Paul here is rebuking that notion. And actually, by the end of the sermon this evening, we should note that he rebukes both sides of the, the debate in that. Uh, but here's the theme with God's help I want to show you tonight. We learn that every member has a significant role in the church. Uh, that every member has a role and a gift to serve in the church. And three points. First of all, we need to note the metaphor of membership, uh, the body of Christ. Secondly, we need to note the misunderstandings of membership, what was going on in the church in Corinth. And then thirdly, and more briefly, the maker of membership, who it is who sovereignly assigns. So the metaphor, the misunderstandings, and then the maker of membership. But first of all, know with me the metaphor of membership, and that is in verses 12 and 13. And you notice right away, notice the unity and diversity that Paul is trying to teach in verse 12. He says, the body is a unit, or literally one, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. Now notice there, Paul is using really in many senses an all too familiar analogy or metaphor for the church, and that is of our bodies. Paul says, think of your body that you have. Uh, you can think of yourself as one. Uh, you, are, you have one body, and, and the whole body, though it is made up of many parts, can be put together to have one function altogether. Our bodies share all of the blood, our bodies share all of the health, our bodies share one purpose altogether. And with that one purpose, Paul says also, there's a diversity. Your body is one, but Paul says you have hands, you have feet, there's a diversity of members of your body, and so it is, Paul says, in the life of the church. You are one, there's unity, but there is diversity in the membership and the use of the gifts. Now, if you really stop for a moment and think about this metaphor, it really shows this mutual dependency, doesn't it? Uh, because we are one. There is only one body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church, and yet we are interconnected with one another. In a moment, Paul's going to get a little playful with this analogy and, and speak of body parts wanting to separate themselves, but it's ludicrous. Your hand and my hand, if it severs itself from the body, is lifeless unless it's connected to the body. And so, this imagery drives home that we are dependent on one another, that we need one another, that our oneness thrives only when uh, we are working together using our gifts that God has given. So the point is we are one living body with diverse gifts, all meant 
to serve the whole. But notice as well, the metaphor is not just one body, but look again at your text at verse 12. Paul says, all of this, that we form one body, so it is with Christ. Now isn't that interesting? Uh, You would read that, you'd almost think, Paul would say, well, so it is with the church. But Paul doesn't say that. Paul says, there's oneness and there's diversity, and so it is with Christ. Now, why does he do that? Well, you see, Paul is driving home the privilege, the blood-bought privilege of what it is to be a member of the church of Christ. He's really driving home, isn't he, the intimacy that we have not only with one another as, as the one body, but he's driving home the intimacy that we have with Christ. He speaks of the church literally as the body of Christ. Christ, of course, is the head of the church. He has intimately connected the church. And so Paul can literally say, so it is with Christ. Now again, if we stop and think about the implications for a moment, this is significant for how we view membership in the life of the church. I think, for example, that this teaches us tonight that the church is united to Christ. We are who we are because of who he is. Think about it, if 2,000 years ago Christ did not come to die on the cross, we would not be gathered here tonight. There would be no church of Christ, there would be no unity to bring us together, but because we share the same Savior, because by faith that we saw this morning, by faith alone, we are so connected to our Savior, we are united to Him, well that is who we are as members of the church. We are intimately connected to Him and therefore as one church. The other implication to think of, and this should really drive home the love of Christ for you, is that this teaches us tonight that as the body of Christ, everything that happens to you and to me affects him. You know, many scholars think that Paul, who brings up this metaphor the most, if not the only uh, writer of the New Testament who brings up the metaphor of the body, many people argue and believe that the reason he came up with this is because of what happened to him as conversion. Do you remember when Christ came to him on the road to Damascus, what did Jesus say to Paul about what he was doing to the church. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In other words, Paul learned that day on the moment of his, or about his conversion, that his persecution of the church was not simply the persecution of Christians, but that Christ felt it. That every Christian that he imprisoned, every person he perhaps put to death, all of that was affecting Christ. Why? Because as Paul shows us here, the church is the body of Christ. When the body suffers, when one member suffers Christ, well, he intimately feels it. To have a direct attack on the church was attack upon Christ himself. And so this reminds us tonight that we are intimately loved. To be a member of the church is not just just one little part of your life and my life. It was a blood-bought privilege that cost the life of God's only Son. To be a member of the church is an extreme privilege privilege. And notice how he goes on the point of oneness here. Look at verse 13. He says, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now, as I found out this week, as you break that text apart, it's actually a difficult, trans- it's a difficult text to translate. Uh, and much in part, if you have a pew Bible, there's a footnote there giving various understandings of a preposition. But I think no matter how you translate that the meaning is always the same paul is driving home that the oneness comes from the fact that you share the same god the holy spirit Uh, let's just break it apart a little bit notice that he says that every member of the church was baptized and i would argue the better translation is in the spirit paul is describing there what happens at conversion Paul's describing this baptism of renewal, the the new birth, that that at the moment of conversion where you are born again, you are baptized, you are sprinkled clean by God the Holy Spirit. Now just as an aside here, what Paul does not mean there is of some sort of second blessing as some of our charismatic brothers and sisters would teach from that. He's not teaching some sort of baptism in the Spirit where you receive spiritual gifts. Paul is talking about the cleansing that happened when God the Holy Spirit indwelled you as a believer. And he goes on, notice that this indwelling indwells a diverse group. It's diverse with ethnicity. He says whether Jew or Greek, the church is made up of every nation, tribe, and tongue. Jesus is bringing uh, all nations into the church, and it's diverse in socioeconomic status. Notice that we are united whether you are a slave, whether you are the poorest of the poor, or whether you are free. 
Whether you are a blue-collar worker today or whether you are a white-collar worker, if you are a member of the Church of Christ by faith and the Spirit indwells you, we are one together. No matter your race or your, your job, we are one together. And then he ends with this idea of the Holy Spirit and dwelling every one, the idea behind that we drink the one Spirit. And I think the whole point is what we saw last week. It is God, the Holy Spirit, that we share Uh, Each believer has the same Spirit. Some believers don't have more of the Spirit or less of the Spirit. It's the one same Holy Spirit uh, that dwells in us. And of course, that is meant to be a rebuke to the church in Corinth. As they divide over these things, Paul is saying, listen, you're foolish. Because each of you have the same Spirit. You're united to the same Savior. And the job of the church is to serve as the united body of Jesus Christ. And so that is the point here. As Paul enters in, he's rebuking them for how they are separating and dividing among themselves. But if you think about it, part of the implications tonight for our pondering as we go from here is to really think about what the church is. Let me ask you that question. Uh, When you think of the church, what do you think of? Do you kind of think of an association or, or just a part of where you're a member? Or do you think of something that's living and vital for your spiritual life? Uh, One commentator I read this week noted this. He says, the church is more a living organism than it is a society. You know, a society, you have a club membership. You can take it or leave it. If you don't pay your dues, eventually you leave. But an organism is vital. Uh, You share life together, and you need other members of the church to sustain you spiritually. Life in the church is vital for our spiritual growth. And, And again, if you think about it, just to press this home, Your membership, if you are a member here, if you think about it, is the most important membership that you have. It is more important uh, than uh, political party. It is certainly more important than country. And think about it this way. It It is even more important in many respects than your family. If you are united to the church or to Christ, the church, by faith, that is the most deep relationship that you and I share, even in many respects, above blood relationship. And here's my point in driving this home. To be a member of the church is the deepest bond possible because of the spirit we all share. And we will spend eternity with one another together. So that is the metaphor. Now, secondly, notice the misunderstandings of membership. Paul takes the bulk of the chapter to highlight the misunderstandings. Uh, Notice, first of all, the first misunderstanding is downplaying or bemoaning one's own spiritual gifts. Look at verse 14. It says, Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Notice that Paul is apparently addressing many in the church in Corinth who are no longer active in the church. And the reason is because they feel they have no role to play in the church. Uh, Paul gets a little playful here. here. He says that if a member of your body, if your hand decided that it didn't want to be a part of the body, just by simply claiming that doesn't mean they can sever itself from the body. If any part of your body decided for a moment to leave and just simply claim, that doesn't mean you're any less a member of the body. Here's Paul's point. You are a body of Christ. If you are a Christian, that is who you are, whether you like it or not, if I can put it that way. And Paul says, as much as you want to claim not to have any role in the church, that does not take away from the fact that God has given you a role. That God has given you a gift. And God has assigned you to that particular local congregation for the purpose of being active in serving your fellow brothers and sisters. It is impossible, if you're a Christian, it is impossible to separate yourself from the church. And even more than that, notice that Paul says that that if all were one part, there would be no body and it would be useless. Now, as we go through the text, Paul's going to repeat that uh, over and over again, but his point is this. You want these greater spiritual gifts, but listen to me, if everyone in the church had that one gift, the body would suffer. Therefore, you are to rejoice in the gifts God has given you. And he says that in verse 19 and 20. He says, if they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. Here's the point. Paul has a word for those who think they're useless in the church. Paul has a word for those who think that they don't have a role to play in the church. Paul says, you have a role. Why? Because you're indwelt with the Spirit. 
Every member of the church has a role to play. Let me ask you tonight, do you feel like you have a role to play in this congregation? Do you feel like you have a role to participate in the life of this church? Paul says, if you are a member of Christ, God has assigned you in His sovereign will and purpose to this particular congregation for the purpose of being active in the church and serving among its members. And so we're not to bemoan or downplay our gifts. We're to be active in serving. But notice the second misunderstanding. That is even worse, excluding other members. Look at verse 21. It says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Now here Paul has a rebuke for those who who are downplaying the gifts of others. These are those prideful, arrogant ones who seem to have the better gifts. And they're saying to other members, you know, really, I don't need you. You can go over the corner, you know, you can still be a member here, but listen, I'm more important than you, I really don't need you, and the arrogance of these members is to think that they're self-sufficient with what God has given them. And Paul here has strong words to say that actually those gifts of people who seem less important actually are more vital than theirs. That their gifts can only function when the hidden members are doing their role. Think about his Uh, analogy here, the hidden parts of the body, those things that we cover up, are actually vital for the function of the body parts that we see. Uh, For example, think of your internal organs. Uh, If your internal organs decide to stop working or shut down, the rest of your body eventually is going to shut down altogether. Your hand could be as strong as it can be, but if your internal organs are not functioning, that hand is absolutely useless. That's Paul's point. Paul says to those who are arrogant, He says, you need to look at your brother and sister and realize that their role of serving behind the scenes, perhaps in unseen ways, keep you functioning in the life of the church. So Paul's point here is this. Each member of the church has a role to play, and for those who have the more seen gifts, they are to acknowledge the gifts of those who go on behind the scene. And I sat down for a moment in preparing the sermon just to think about the unseen roles that that really go on in this church, and there's numerous roles that many of you play that, that go on, for the most part, unseen. Let me give you an example of some. Think about those who serve on the music committee. Every Sunday they accompany us and they assist us in worship. I think about those on the fellowship committee, serving of their time to bring fellowship here and serving very diligently for all of these meals that get put together. I think about those on the building committee, using all of their gifts to keep the building functioning. Again, we could go on with numerous other gifts, other roles at play, and Paul's point is if those things are not taking place, the ministry of the church will be hampered. So whether you have a gift that's visible here at this church or you take place behind the scenes, Paul's point is like a body, there's greater honor in many respects to those parts who play on in many ways that are hidden. And then the third misunderstanding is simply really an emphasis again on the need of diversity. We don't need to reread it, but in verses 27 through 31, Paul goes through a list of very spiritual gifts, and then he ends asking the questions. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? In the Greek, the implied answer is no. If everyone had those gifts, the rest of the service of the church would fall away and the ministry would go uh, and fall to the wayside. The misunderstanding is that there needs to be diversity in the body. But notice how he ends, and I think this is his point he's driving home. He says in verse 31, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now that's going to play an important role in chapter 14 where Paul drives home that the desire of every church is to have gifts that don't serve the self, but actually serve the church. He's going to talk about the difference between prophecy and speaking in tongues. And Paul says, any gift that serves others are those gifts that you need to strive for and and desire because you will be serving the church. And actually, before we get to chapter 14, Paul has chapter 13, which is the chapter on love. And Paul is driving home the point is this. It doesn't really matter what gift you will have. What matters is that you love and serve the church. In fact, I pondered that this week. It's interesting. Uh, 
there's so much confusion in many respects over gifts and trying to figure out what gift we have. And I don't think the point is to try to agonize over what particular gift we have. Paul's point is simply this, to serve, to get active in the church and to play a role. You know, one question that came to my mind this week is, is uh, if you see a need in the church that's lacking, perhaps God has shown you that need for you to fill the role. Uh, The elders are well aware that we can't see everything, we can't cover everything, there's things that may be lacking, and if God has put something before you where you see a lack maybe in fellowship or a lack somewhere in ministry, well, maybe God is showing you that for service in the church. The point is, every member has a role to play, every member is vital to the life of the church, and the church is to foster that among its membership. Well, thirdly and finally, I just want to briefly note here now the maker of membership. Uh, Throughout the text, Paul repeatedly goes back to God's sovereign assignment in each of the bodies. I just want to note the reasoning for that. Look at verse 18 again. Let's back up. Notice God's arrangement for the good of the church. It says, but in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. You see, that's in the context of those who bemoan the gift. And Paul literally is saying, if you bemoan your gift and you think you have no role to play, you're actually complaining to God. If you complain that God has not given you a role in the life of the church, you're actually saying, I know better than God and He hasn't given me what I need. Paul's point is this. God is sovereign over who you are and where He has placed you. God has given the gifts that are needed for the church and He assures that what is needed is good for the body. Again, the application is to simply serve faithfully and God will carry on with the rest. And even more than that, notice God's arrangement for sharing. Look at verse 24 through 26. It says, But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And I love verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Notice that. Paul says whether you have a visible gift, whether you have a hidden gift, notice this, God has arranged the body with this diversity of hidden gifts and visible gifts for the purpose of feeling each other's sorrow and celebrating each other's joys. Again, this drives home the intimate connection of what it is to be the church. Being a member of the church is not something you do on Sunday and then go about your life. Being a member of the church takes place throughout the week. That when a member of this church suffers, the point is that the body feels it. And we come in around that fellow member. We encourage. We support. Why? Because we feel it. Interesting, for example, if you've ever had a toothache, if you just have a toothache that's just one little tooth in your mouth, you would think that would be insignificant. But that pain is so bad, the whole body suffers because of it. That's the point. We are so intimately connected that if one member is suffering and and falling to the wayside, the church needs to come around that member to support, to encourage, and to carry on with. By way of example, one point of application. If you notice someone is not or someone not attending and missing for a couple of weeks, call that member. Say to them, I've missed you. Is something going on? It is the member's duty, each of our duties, to reach out to support and encourage and to work with each other. Paul says the diversity is meant to feel one another because when one member suffers, the whole body is hampered. If one Christian slowly falls away to the wayside, the body begins to feel the lack of the service, or should feel the lack of service of that member. And so here's the point. Church membership with one another is one of the most intimate things that we have in this life, and we are to care for one another and bear one another's burdens, and celebrate also with one another. Now, we're going to leave it there. Next week, we're going to pick up more with that theme of caring for one another as Paul opens up what true love is and what that looks like in light of the church. But Paul is speaking to this church, dividing and hurting one another, and Paul says, you're actually hurting yourself. Repent, unite together, work as the body of Christ. And so, in conclusion tonight, two things briefly that I just want to end on just to to wrap things up and to give you some thoughts to consider for the week ahead. First of all, I want to end with a note of the gospel here. When you really think about all that Paul says in this chapter, does it not teach us the greatness of grace? Because two things are true at the same time. That Christ died for the church as a whole, that is amazing enough, 
But not only that, Christ died for each individual that is a member of the church. Let me ask you, when's the last time you thought of Christ dying on the cross for you, particularly? If you're a Christian here this evening, that is exactly what he did. As he hung on Calvary's tree, he hung there for his elect, those people God had given to him to die for. And as you think of your membership in this church, it should drive home, I am that loved. Church is not something I just do because I do it. I do it because Christ died for me. And as a church of Christ, as we live here in New Haven, Vermont, we live here not by accident, because Christ died to secure this body of a local congregation so we would serve one another and witness to the church around us. Christian, this is amazing grace. Church is a living testimony of a Savior who died to redeem lost sinners, to bring us together. This is what unites us as a church, and that is why we need to end tonight by realizing this is a blood-bought privilege. To be a member of the church cost the life of God's own Son. And secondly as well, let me end with emphasizing the need for one another. Again, think of your body, how your body needs other members in order to live. That teaches us tonight that you and I need each other with fellowship and community. Again, church is not some sort of a Sunday social club it is a vital living organism where we serve and build up one another for each other's good. Spiritually speaking, we need one another. And as I thought on that this week, it brought me right back to the author of Hebrews and his encouragement to not forsake the assembling of the saints. Why would he say something like that? Well, he goes on to say it's because you need it and they need it. You need it because you need to be encouraged on in life. You need the fellowship of the saints and your brother sitting in the pew next to you, he needs you to encourage them. Christian, we need to be reminded we cannot be Lone Ranger Christians. To be a member of the church is vital for ourselves spiritually and for our brothers and sisters. It plays a significant role in our pilgrimage in this life. And so as the body of Jesus Christ, let us love and serve one another, feeling each other's sorrows and pains, celebrating each other's joys until Christ our head comes. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Father, we thank you for his death. We thank you for uniting us together. And Father, we thank you for making us one together in him. Father, as your church, teach us as we study these things of spiritual gifts. Father, apply them to all of our hearts tonight that we would joyfully serve, that we would joyfully build each other up. And Father, we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.